Well, good morning, everyone, and um, welcome to today's event on the subject of making building codes work. My name is Peter Oborn, and I'm president of the Commonwealth Association of Architects. Before we get underway, um, I'd like to offer some brief introductory remarks on the reasons why we've chosen to feature this important subject today. Uh, Asim, I can't see myself on screen, so I'm hoping that the Zoom uh, is working. Please, please proceed. We can see you, Peter. We okay, great. Okay, so um, those of you that are familiar with the work of the CAA over the past few years will be aware of the survey of the built environment professions in the Commonwealth, which we published in 2020. And if I could have my slides, Asim. The first slide shows that, um, uh, the first finding rather from the survey showed that there was a critical lack of capacity in a number of Commonwealth countries, uh, many of which are urbanizing rapidly uh, and are among the most vulnerable to climate change impacts. The second finding was that there's a corresponding lack of educational and institutional capacity um, to grow the profession fast enough in a number of Commonwealth countries. And the third finding, which is really why we're here today, of course, is that there's a perceived weakness in built environment policy in many of the Commonwealth countries uh, in terms of standards, implementation and enforcement. On the next slide, you'll see that 30% of the respondents told us that their planning policy isn't fit for purpose um, and that their building code is similarly uh, not fit for purpose. So you can see from this slide that 30% of the respondents to that survey said that their planning policy wasn't um, fit for purpose. 60% said it wasn't being implemented effectively. Nearly 50% said that their building code wasn't fit for purpose and almost well, over 70% said it wasn't being uh, implemented effectively. On the next slide, you'll see that um, towards the end of last year, uh, the CAA undertook a fact-finding survey amongst uh, 16 of its member organizations um, that are signatories to our knowledge-sharing partnership. And you'll see from this slide that the overwhelming majority of respondents from older um, uh, countries, i.e. countries which are receipt of um, official development assistance, uh, remain of the opinion that enforcement of their national building code uh, is ineffective, which is obviously very troubling. Next slide, please, Asim. Um, this is incredibly important, especially when you consider that, uh, according to the International Energy Agency, um, over the next 40 years, we're projecting over 90 billion square meters of additional floor space in Africa alone. Next slide, please, Asim. Um, and we also, of course, need to consider that 95% um, uh, uh, of those countries in Asia and Africa um, are also amongst the most vulnerable to climate change risk. So we have an issue here around um, adaptation. And next slide, please, Asim. And we also have uh, uh, an even more serious issue in terms of um, mitigation. And you can see from this slide that again, according to the International Energy Agency, um, admittedly a few years old now, but at that point, um, there was barely a country on the African continent that had uh, a mandatory energy code, which is incredibly important when you think about that in terms of um, climate change um, that we're facing. So how, against this backdrop, uh, do we expect to achieve the objectives of SDG 11 to make cities, human settlements, inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable? Next slide, please, Asim. So this is why we decided to host today's event, uh, to hear from them of some of those who have been working in this area, and particularly the work that's been undertaken to strength strengthen national building codes among small island states, which are in the forefront of climate change. By the time we reach the end of today's event, I'd hope that we've been able to identify some of the barriers and enablers to the successful design and implementation of National Building Code, which can be applied throughout the Commonwealth and beyond. So that's for me um, in terms of background. So turning to today's event, I'm, I'm really pleased to introduce the following group of experts who have joined us all at different hours of the day and night, um, because we're spanning the Pacific and the Caribbean. Um, to share their experiences with us. Um, first up is going to be Mr. Timothy Stats, Technical Assistance Officer from the Pacific Region Infrastructure Facility in Fiji. He'll be followed by Ms. Anne Milbank, a former Assistant Chief Executive of the Buildings Division at the Ministry of Works, Transport and Infrastructure in Samoa. Uh, and she will be followed by Mr. Andrew Penny, the Government's Chief Architect at the Ministry of Public Works, uh, again in Fiji. And then we'll be switching to the Caribbean, where we'll uh, hear from Dr. Winston McCalla from Jamaica, who is a former Assistant Attorney General and a former Director of Legal Reform. And then finally, in the kind of um, the more structured part of the session, we're going to hear from Ms. Maria Musmuti, 
who is an associate research fellow at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies in London. Uh, once we've finished the kind of short presentations, we're then going to break into a discussion and there'll be plenty of opportunity for questions and answers as well. Uh, and we're going to be joined by Mr. Robert Lewis Lettington, who is Chief of the Land, Housing and Shelter Section and former Chief of the Urban Legislation Branch at UN Habitat, um, based in Kenya, but currently um, joining us from Switzerland. Um, we also have Mr. Jonathan Duvin from the um, Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction. And Jonathan has just come back from... Uh, a two-day event in Paris, which he'll no doubt be telling us about, um, focused on the area of uh, buildings and climate change. And then finally, not last but by no means least, Mr. George Arabun Ndeji from Kenya, who is the Vice President of the Architectural Association of Kenya, and will be giving us um, something of an African perspective on the, on the subject. Um, in terms of the session outline, um, we're going to hear from Tim first off on the work that he's been doing on the National Building Codes in the Pacific. We'll then hear a, a perspective from Samoa, um, who adopted uh, a, a new building code in 2017. And then from Fiji, which is actually in the process of uh, updating its building code, and I believe Andrew will tell us it's before Parliament at the moment. Uh, as I said, we'll then we'll then hear from sort of some comparable experiences from the Caribbean and I've and I put down here. We'll then we'll then hear how to fix it rather glibly from from Maria. But hopefully we'll get some lessons and we'll draw some sort of some thoughts from those four presentations. So uh, and then we'll break for panel discussion and and Q and A. So I think that's it from me. Um, but before I hand over to um, Tim, uh, we thought we'd just run a couple of quick polls uh, because it'd be always it was always interesting to know who we're speaking to and who's in the room, so to speak. So I'm going to ask my colleague Asim now if he'd run the first of two polls, uh, which basically asks you the question, which region are you from? Um, so we'd just like to see where in the world our audience is joining us from. Are you from Africa, from Asia, from the Caribbean and Americas, from Europe or the Pacific? If you could just quickly make a selection and I'll then ask Asim if he could perhaps give us the results. Okay. So uh, representation from all five regions, but um, uh, maybe it's because of the time of day. I'm very conscious it's very early in the Caribbean and, the, and very late in the Pacific. Um, we have quite a significant um, representation from Africa. And I did see it as, uh, as people were joining that we also have someone here from Bahrain, which is, a, which is nice to see. Uh, so the second uh, poll, very quickly, is just going to ask what, uh, what your background is in terms of um, whether you're a student, whether you're a member of teaching faculty, whether you're a practitioner, and that could be a lawyer, an architect, an engineer, whether you represent a professional association, and then whether you're from local or central government. Again, it just gives us a sort of flavor of who we're speaking to. So um, I'm, I'm very pleased that we have got some <laughs> representatives from central and local government. Um, interested that there are a lot of practitioners and um, good to see a number of professional associations represented. Uh, this is such an important topic um, that it should appeal to a broad constituency because building code is something that we're all going to have to engage with throughout our careers. And um, it really is going to have a huge impact on the outcomes we're seeking. So at this point, I'm now going to hand over to the first of our presenters, um, Tim Stats um, from PRIF in Fiji. Tim, over to you. Many thanks for the introduction, Peter. Um, uh, it's uh, my pleasure to join everybody uh, from Suva, and um, I'm hoping to provide an overview of uh, some of the challenges uh, and the opportunities uh, that uh, Proof understands uh, we're facing uh, in the Pacific um, regards to building codes um, and the application of them. Um, so. Just a, a, an introduction to PRIF, uh, as the name would suggest, we are a, a facility made up where we have eight development partners uh, that you can see listed at the top. Uh, and then we have 13 uh, member countries uh, and that's, uh, that spans across the Pacific and we have uh, Papua New Guinea as, a, as, a, as an associate member. Um, so um, as uh, Peter touched upon, uh, we also agree that uh, national building codes have an important role to play in ensuring the design and delivery of construction in our region is accept is to acceptable standards. And we're talking about structural sufficiency, fire safety, health and amenity, 
um, and it can resist natural uh, disasters and the challenges from climate change. Um, but also, just as importantly, um, it can uh, present value for money construction outcomes. Um, to give you a little bit of a flavour um, uh, of what we're looking at here in the Pacific, I've, I've grabbed a collection of photos. And obviously what you can see here are materials and uh, appliances that uh, obviously are not fit for purpose. These are all relatively new. There's a map of the Pacific, 13 countries, and at the top are the eight development partners um, that support uh, uh, the Pacific Region Infrastructure Facility. Um, here are some of those photos I was talking about. Um, much easier, uh, I think, uh, with a photo for a thousand words. Um, uh, you can see here, uh, obviously, the effects of salt um, with many of the Pacific Island countries highly exposed um, to um, uh, to salt from, from the ocean. Um, unfortunately, um, in terms of um, accidents and loss of life, um, I don't have the, it's, we don't have data on it, but um, it, it's anecdotally uh, a large number of, uh, of, of people are, are passing away. Um, electrical safety, also fire safety, um, and then ill health due to poor sanitation practices. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, at the forefront of everybody's minds in the Pacific are natural disasters, uh, highly exposed to cyclo cyclones, um, and then also even just a, a high tide events, king tides, um, and then uh, even ashfall, if we're thinking at about countries like Vanuatu and uh, and Tonga in recent years. Um, so to give a little bit of an overview, uh, we've had a close look at at the building codes across the Pacific, and uh, in a, a very sort of short explanation, um, most countries have a building code, um, and most countries those building codes are heavily influenced by the colonial history. Um, and in the Pacific, there's three main sort of influences. Uh, across the north, we have uh, um, a number of countries, Palau, FSM, Marshall Islands, that are influenced by the US uh, base codes and standards. Through the centre, there's a lot of, of the countries that are influenced by Australia and New Zealand. And then there's also a number of countries that are influenced by the French uh, and the European codes, of course, and, and American Samoa in here would uh, would be grouped with the, the above. Um so in, in terms of sort of trying to pin down three of the main challenges, uh, the first challenge is, is that these codes are outdated, um, uh, the codes and or the legislation. Uh, most of the codes date back to about the 1990s, um, uh, but you can see there's a number of countries where, where codes are yet to exist. Um, and there's also a number of countries where the legislation is, um, uh, is, is lacking, it's not in place. Um, and then where those codes or legislation are in place, there's only a few instances where we would say that they are up to date. And, and uh, generally speaking, that's with a revision in the last five years. Um, so uh, this is uh, the findings that I'm presenting come from a, a number of reports that we've done that are available on on. On, uh, on our webpage. Uh, this is a diagnostic study that included three deep dives into three different countries, um, Solomons, Fiji and Vanuatu. And then more recently, we've had a look at uh, trying to understand the, um, the and, and I guess advocate uh, for greater coordination and harmonization of the codes across the Pacific. And that's captured in another report. Um, so the the second challenge that I'd probably like to highlight is 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 with that legislation. Um, we spoke to thirteen countries and and canvassed their views. Um, and you can see here that the the biggest obstacle is that um, at the local council level or at the municipal level, the bylaws are often inconsistent uh, with what the legislation at the national level is is trying to do. Um, and uh, and that's a that's a slow process. It's difficult to update, uh, and it requires, uh, in most cases in the Pacific, support from development partners. Um, the third challenge there, and this is where we we really uh, see a lot of uh, the biggest challenge, I would say, uh, is what we call in the building control institutional frameworks. So what I'm getting at there is with compliance and the enforcement of the building codes, even if the building codes exist, the compliance um, at, uh, at 
you know, by uh, owner builders, uh, even in some cases by commercial um, in commercial buildings is low. Um, and uh, some of the reasons are the um, understanding within the industries, uh, but then the, uh, I guess you'd say the um, insufficient capacity within the uh, authorities to um, enforce um, what they have given permits for, to do supervisions throughout the process, and then to issue the, the certificates. Um, and in the Pacific, um, it's particularly in recent years, that's basically due to uh, lack of, of, of resources. Um, there's been a lot of migration out and the authorities um, understand the importance of the job, but lack uh, the people on the ground to be able to do that. Um, so the key finding there is that uh, they need to re uh, review their strategies and we need to, uh, to identify support in helping to uh, have the qualified inspectors um, and, uh, and with the training that they need. Um, a key example is last year we supported Curibus um, to revise their building code. When we began working with them in early 2022, uh, they had eight engineers within the Ministry of Infrastructure, Quality Control and Inspection Division. That's now, um, as of January, down to a single engineer. And the design division had two architects, and now they have zero. So uh, there is a, a very uh, dire trend um, that's uh, currently underway. Uh, and then the last challenge there is it's with the hazard design parameters, uh, with the uh, Pacific countries being so exposed to natural disasters and the effects of climate change, um, the codes that were written in the 90s, some of them have been updated in the early 2000s, but they're they're out of date uh, regarding uh, wind speeds, rainfall, uh, sea level rise, um, and uh, and also seismic data that's uh, um, that needs to be updated. Um, so, and some of the good news there is that some of that can be done at a regional level, and there can be some cost savings. Um, so if sort of wrapping up and trying to finish on a, some uh, with some positive notes um, after all the gloom and doom of the the, um, the, the climate change, um, what we found by talking to the 13 countries is that um, there is generally perceived to be a very strong uh, benefit to maintaining similar MBCs across the Pacific. It allows people to work, for, uh, to travel for work from one country to another and for um, learning to have to also be done in a, in a regional sense. Um, there is a case for developing Pacific specific standards. Um, there are materials in the Pacific, there's technologies, there's ways of doing things which are unique and are not supported currently by appropriate standards. Um, and that there is a, um, a strong um, argument for this to be done in a more sustainable manner. Um, I, the support of a development partner or PRIF is appreciated on an ad hoc basis, but at the moment there is lacking a um, permanent and sustainable um, central uh, organisation that co can coordinate, advocate, manage and advise and support governments with maintaining and improving their building codes. Uh, so we see that as a, as a big opportunity. Um, and just I'll skip over this because I know we're struggling for time, but uh, just to note that this year we'll be supporting Vanuatu with a revision of their code. Um, we'll be doing uh, developing some regional guidance in the Pacific. Um, we'll try and draw from other examples from other areas in the Caribbean and Africa uh, on developing that regional guidance. Uh, we're trying to foster greater conversations from practitioners within the Pacific so that they can share and learn from each other. And then we'll be undertaking a feasibility study, which will be looking at that idea of a regional secretariat, looking at um, how that could be funded and, and where that would sit, et cetera. Um, so a recap there. But um, yeah, uh, thank you very much for, for listening to me. And I look forward to hearing from the, the other presenters and uh, engaging in the discussion uh, towards, the, um, towards the end. Thanks very much, Peter. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, and thanks for sort of diving straight into uh, the issues that I think we're going to find, or I suspect, are going to be recurring throughout the session. Um, quite surprising to hear that there are still Pacific Islands that don't have building codes. Um, obviously, quite uh, distressing to hear that they're not being supported adequately through legislation and resourcing. But again, let's see what others have to say on that subject. Um, 
So Anne uh, Milbank from Samoa, um, you helped develop the new Samoan National Building Code, which I think was adopted a few years ago. Perhaps you'd like to uh, give us the benefit of your experience and tell us um, what lessons we can learn from, from the work you've been doing in Samoa. Over to okay, you, well, yep. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, Timothy, for your introduction to the situation in the Pacific. Um, are we able to start my slideshow? Yeah. Do you want us to run that for you? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. It's on now. Uh, yeah, able to full screen it. Yeah, awesome. There you go. That'll do it. Okay. So, um, this, um, well, I'll just give you a background of, um, my work in Samoa. So at this time of the, uh, revision of the Samoa uh, National Building Code in 2017. I was the uh, assistant um, ACEO, CEO for the Ministry of Works, Transport and Infrastructure for the Building Division. And um, the uh, Building Code is um, was part of a revision, was part of a, a UNDP project called the um, Economy-Wide um, Adaptation to Climate Change. So it was one of the components of, of that project. Um, so we'll just go to the next slide and I'll just tell you a bit about the history of building codes in Samoa. Um, so with a lot of colonies, I think you'll find even in Fiji, um, the original um, uh, regulation of building and construction is usually done through public health. So a lot of the plumbing and things like that was done through the um, through the Ministry of Health or the or the public health um, departments until um, 1992, when um, when the first Samoa National Building Code was drafted. Now, both of these um, building codes. So there's, this, there's only been two times. One was when the code was first drafted, and then the revision in 2017. But both of these. Um, uh, projects basically were undertaken in response to a um, natural disaster. So they were, they were very sort of reactive sort of documents. Um, the first one was in 1992. It was following two um, very um, damaging um, cyclones, um, Cyclone Orfa in 1990 and Cyclone Val in 1991. And um, they had very, um, very damaging cyclones and it was a very big wake-up call for Samoa that they needed to have building codes and to um you know to to design for these strong winds that they'd never seen before that 11 people died in one of the um in, in cyclone offer and I think Val had lost about eight people so they were quite dangerous um so the first iteration of the Samoa National Building Code in 1992 was based on um, New Zealand and Australian um, building codes, similar structure, all New Zealand Australian um, reference standards. And then when we came to 2017, the key driver for that um, building code revision was um, after natural disasters as well. There was the tsunami in 2009. And then Cyclone Evan in 2012. Cyclone Evan was different than the other cyclones. And um, they, it's as a result of climate change, um, is what experts are saying, is that the, there's a, a larger amount of rainfall and the, so the flooding in Samoa has become a lot worse. So when this um, building code was revised, there were emphasis placed on flooding, energy efficiency, tsunami, storm surge, and then obviously updated um, accessibility. So these were the key things that we were trying to include in the building code. Um, we had a building board, basically a, 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 a work task force, and we went through each um, each chapter by chapter, um, revising um, one as we went. So um, it was a very sort of um, collaborative uh, project use, um, with government agencies and people in the private sector as well. So there was a lot of um, country ownership with, with, with the building code revision. Um, this is just um, explaining how um, the legislative setup is with the with the building code right now. Um, so um, the building code sits under the Ministry of Works Act. The Ministry of Works Act also has transport, um, land transport, aviation, and shipping in it as well. But part four is the building regulations, and within that, um, enacts the um, the building code. 
Um, and obviously, because, you know, the building code is quite a complex document for, for most um, people, um, handbooks and standard plans have been produced for um, residential buildings. So can we go to the next slide? So this is just basically what's in the building code right now. Um, and you can see those two highlighted um, ones, climate change adaptation and um, disaster resilience. So they're, they're two um, uh, sections that obviously weren't in the first building code. Um, and we've got more um, emphasis on energy efficiency and, um, and stormwater management on site. So it's a performance-based code. It's based on the New Zealand um, building code structure and it's mainly used in New Zealand Australian standards and acceptable solutions so that it's um you know like because obviously New Zealand has a strong tie with New Zealand so it was it was sort of um the the most logical path um as Timothy was explaining that Samoa and and all of our area is um uses Australian and New Zealand standards um can we go to the next slide please so with the um, actual implementation of the 2017 building code, there were obviously um, challenges and opportunities. Some of the challenges were we weren't given a very big budget to develop the building code and there was no budget to actually implement it. So when the building code was put in um, to parliament, tabled in parliament and approved, there was no budget for um, for training staff, there was no budget for um, for stakeholder engagement and all the ongoing support that's needed to um, to ensure that you know, like the that the, that the code is is utilized correctly, that people know how to use the code, and that um and that the the, the public was um <clears throat> has um accepted it, and also um. It was 25 years since the, oh, you'll have to excuse me, <laughs> since the review of the last um, code. And so um, there was a lot of changes to be made, obviously, after 25 years. Um, <coughs> I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> there were a lot of changes to be made. Um, we were required to cooperate with a lot of other agencies. So some agencies um, were not as supportive within the government as others. And then there's also the issue of um, sharing information. And, um, and um, can I just, um, uh, Peter? And, and you take, take a break. And um... Can I get back to you? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> no problem. You. You, you take a break and we'll we'll move on to um uh Andrew from Fiji. Uh uh I think it's really interesting to hear from you Anne, that um it took two crises to actually um prompt updating of the code uh, because of course we're facing a crisis now in terms of climate change and uh, it's not quite so obvious perhaps as a as a cyclone or a hurricane. Um, I'm also interested to hear that you decided to base your code on a performance code. We don't necessarily have the time to go into the difference between performance and prescriptive codes, but um, but uh, normally I would have expected a performance code to be applied to a market that was perhaps a little bit more uh, developed in some ways. However, um, we can come back to this in, in Q&A, and we are already receiving some questions, so please, if you have questions, um, put them in the, uh, the Q&A box. Um, I'd also just like to acknowledge before Andrew comes on the the timing of this event, because we've had some comments in the chat about the fact that it's very late in Australia, for example. And I just want to explain that um, one of the reasons for hosting this event was to bring the Pacific and the Caribbean together. We've, we've had another event on making mutual recognition agreements work, where, again, we felt there was an opportunity for cross-learning between the two regions. And um, so we apologize for the fact that the time doesn't suit all, um, but it is intentional um, because we feel it's important for the knowledge sharing to between the Caribbean and the Pacific to take place um, wherever possible. So Andrew, on that, uh, um, uh, let's hear how things are going in Fiji um, with the code that you're in the process of developing and I believe now is going through Parliament. So Andrew, over to you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm based with the Ministry for Public Works in Fiji. 
and I'm a current uh, member of the review uh, team that's uh, looking at the new building code uh, that's in process at the moment. Um, the presentation today on uh, making buildings work, I've got a, a small outline on this first slide and I will be spending more time on part B, the challenges. I'll just run through the climate change backgrounds very quickly on the next slide and then lead up to the um, challenges as fast as I can. Okay, um, uh, as usual, uh, Fiji 2 uh, took a reactive response to damages due to cyclones and uh, And uh, our first building code in 1990, about 34 years ago, was uh, came about due to cyclones uh, damaging the country. And now, uh, recently, with the uh, Cat 5 cyclones hitting uh, Fiji uh, around uh, 21 and a couple of years prior to that, it uh, generated the need to up update the code. So uh, also on the pictures on the slide in front of you is climate, uh, uh, the need for uh, cleaner energy. And so our new building code has got all the components uh, similar to the ones mentioned by Saab Moore, and I'm sure by other building code reviews that are happening at the moment, energy efficiency and climate change effects. On the next slide, uh, examples of what we have in the building code itself, with the first pair on the left side, uh, representing the need for us to increase the uh, wind uh, uh, loading capacity of the buildings from cat three and then now going into cat four and uh, cat low cat fives. Um, there's also uh, flooding and coastal protection issues that we're addressing in the building code in the two pictures, uh, one on the coastline and one on flood prone areas. Um, the other picture of uh, uh, rainwater harvesting uh, has come about due to the need to be able to um, have continuous water supply and also uh, a cleaner wastewater management system. Um, there is also the fourth picture to do with uh, address energy efficiency and uh, focus on renewable energy, uh, which would be li linked to natural ventilation and natural lighting. The next slide as the beginning of the challenges that we have in Fiji. Now, um, to begin with, uh, the first issue is to do with ownership and uh, being committed to the task at hand and having as many of the, uh, as much of the population involved in the process. So what the Fijian government did was put out a uh, uh, legislation uh, called the Fiji Climate Change Act, uh, which required all departments and all organizations to adjust and align their policies and standard operating procedures uh, to show how they're achieving uh, uh, climate change targets. Eh? Uh, they also, um, uh, in line, uh, the, the building code is also aligned with the global uh, renewable energy targets of 2030 and the 2050 net zero targets. So uh, these are part of the Climate Change Act uh, components that we are aligning the building code with. The other part of getting people committed to this process involved, uh, is uh, related to having the local experts, the recognized local experts, be uh, part of the review team. Uh, their presence and contribution uh, ensures that uh, there's, there's less um, disagreement and uh, more consensus right through the, all the process, right from uh, review up to parliamentary uh, discussions and the passing of the legislations. And, and that's a very important part to reduce the, the de derailing of the process. Uh, challenges I highlight here as cost. This is a very big item um, for a country like Fiji, uh, where a lot of things have to do with affordability. And a lot of people want to go to cheap alternate uh, options. So what we had to do with the building code was to allow for varying uh, levels of compliance 
and at sometimes uh, consider how we would uh, provide phased exemptions. Um, for example, the wind load uh, increase that we require to get up to Cat 5 uh, uh, resilience um, will be applied to buildings of uh, high importance levels like high hospitals, evacuation centers, and buildings that need to be standing uh, to service uh, affected people during disasters and after disasters. Um, there are buildings that are the next level down from those emergency buildings, and they would have a lower category level uh, to comply with. And so that's an example of uh, having different levels of compliance. Um, uh, there's another varying amount of uh, compliance that we, we see and we expect uh, when we discuss green um, green uh, greenness and um, this has to do with affordable affordability of the options that are being given to the community there are uh, there is free natural ventilation and free light uh, natural lighting and these options when we are uh, assessing buildings on how green they are and if they meet the uh, appropriate level of greenness these free uh, uh, strategies will be compulsory, but um, the ones that involve having to tint glasses, uh, provide tinted glass and um, other more cost uh, related uh, items, we may be able to provide uh, exemptions for the lower end of the uh, income uh, uh, bracket. Um, so that's another level of uh, varying of complaints that we think we we're considering in order to get as many more people uh, tied into the uh, move that we are uh, putting into place. Um, in terms of exemption, a phased exemptions, because we, we cannot continue to um, allow people not to comply. So there, there is likely to be a uh, time period by when people will have to comply. And um, this is for our informal settlements and our um, Itoke village settings. Um, the towns are very well developed and can afford, and a lot of commercial buildings are financed their uh, compliance with building with the building codes very easily. So um, there is discussion that there will be a gradual um, enforcement of various items in the uh, building code. So, for example, churches in the villages will definitely have to be at the right compliance level, and then uh, the other buildings, uh, residentials, and uh, Stories, storage uh, facilities might um, have a later date to get up to the required cap four or high cap three um, uh, compliance requirements. Um, in terms of cost, part two of it uh, talks uh, highlights how the government is now having to consider subsidizing the financing of these um, code compliant buildings. And so we have um, uh, public housing, affordable public housing, uh, where the government uh, puts out, uh, funded by whatever agency, uh, mass uh, code compliant housing, and then the tenants move in and uh, pay back, pay off on uh, uh, monthly installments because the, bigger the because bit of the problem is that they don't have the big capital to, to put out when they're building the whole house uh, in the first place. So another area of um, subsidized financing is in having government uh, provide uh, two thirds of the cost of construction, and then the owner provide one third. Uh, another area of uh, financial incentives is in, to do with uh, uh, insurance uh, premiums. And so the discussion is about giving lower premiums for buildings that are code compliant. Um, another area that involves cost and affordability is the ability to use uh, local building materials. Um, a, big, a good example is uh, there's a lot of timber here, but uh, the ability to use it into multi-story and uh, uh, develop it into cross-laminated timber for 10-story buildings and multi-story buildings is still uh, hasn't reached the Pacific yet. I think it is in Australia, and uh, well, Australia is quite close to us, but we, we have to look in research and development of uh, local uh, green uh, materials. and. The timber is one of them. The next one is bamboo. Uh, bamboo here is uh, takes five years to mature compared to our fastest maturing um, timber, which is pine in Fiji. Pine takes 15 years, and the recovery from a cyclone uh, is logically going to favor a five-year product. But at the moment, we have to 
push the research and development of how to uh, improve the resilience of uh, well bamboo is strong but uh, resilience to insects and uh, water uh, are the main obstacles so uh, research and development another area of uh, challenges for us is uh, in uh, getting out various levels of the enforcement structure uh, working effectively and so uh, we've got the primary enforcement uh, down at the local governments and this is assisted in the rural areas by Ministry of Health and Rural Development, and uh, then the Ministry of Inf Infrastructure that I'm in uh, forms the ultimate backup for the both uh, the earlier two mentioned uh, enforcement agencies. For all these three levels of enforcement, uh, some of the strategies in place to improve uh, the processing and enforcement involves uh, uh, digitization of the uh, uh, application, uh, building permit applications uh, process, and um, using of uh, the neighboring uh, ministry experts to help out if there's a short if there's a shortfall in the local governments, as I mentioned uh, earlier, Ministry of Infrastructure is the backup source. I've also highlighted the need for training and knowledge transfer, and uh, you'll find that in this slide I've highlighted these two items in red: the training and the R and D of local uh, green options. Um, this uh, uh, two added items, I've put it as a uh, recommend. Well, uh, I feel the best way forward for Fiji. And on the next slide, it's about affordability and self reliance as the way forward to what making building codes work. Um, because the big component is cost for us. And uh, I've just highlighted uh, what we all have been using uh, uh, solar energy and the renewable energy targets using of uh, bio-based strategies where mangrove combined with seawalls can help improve the life or the uh, resilience of the uh, foreshore protection, uh, bamboo research that needs to be done. And uh, this is one of the results on our front that's um, pioneered well, the use of timber on, uh, it's, well, it's already been done uh, around the world, um, timber shingles, uh, laminated timber portals for high spanning uh, timber structures. And uh, basically it's local materials that we'd like to develop uh, both timber and bamboo. So uh, that's the end of this uh, six slides and um, the question and answer time, we can go through uh, any queries that you may have. Thank you, Peter. Andrew, thanks very much. Um, and thanks very much for introducing a few new concepts like the idea of varying levels of compliance to deal with the affordability uh, exemptions. And, and of course, this really important issue of bio-based materials. Um, how do we how do we codify them in a way that we can actually use them um, in a way that we know is going to be safe uh, and such like? So um, the conversation is getting richer. Um, but we're now going to, or rather, and we're now going to swap, swap over to the Caribbean to hear from uh, Winston McCalla, um on the twin challenges of implementation enforcement, which we've heard about um, already from some of our speakers. So, Winston, we're running a little bit behind. We're five minutes behind. Um, over to you for your contribution. And I think Asim is going to share your slides. Okay, thank you very much. And um, my name again is Winston McCalla from Jamaica. We're in the Attorney General's Department as Assistant Attorney General and Director of Law Reform. And in more recent years, I've been working in the Caribbean in the drafting of planning and building legislation. My first slide will just give you a, over a quick picture of the Caribbean region. Um, the Caribbean region really is not monolithic. It's, it's a composite of many different countries. Um, so, we have the CARICOM countries, which are basically the English-speaking countries, um, and they form CARICOM. And there are island states, mainly, but there are also three states, which are one, Belize is part of the of Central America, and then we have Guyana, which is part of South America. The CARICOM, actually, interesting enough, includes Suriname, which is a Dutch-speaking country with Dutch legislation but there is some movement for collaboration. Outside of that, they are the UK territories. Because of language, history, and legislation, many of them are very close to the CARICOM in terms of building practices and building codes. Uh, we also have the Dutch um, and the French territories. 
and those building codes are aligned to um, to the Dutch and French respectively. We also have Spanish-speaking countries such as Cuba and Dominican Republic, and they their situation is totally different from the rest of the English-speaking Caribbean. Okay, the um, I should say CARICOM is also um, an economic unit with also aspirations of harmonization. So CARICOM plays a major role in terms of harmonizing the situation. A quick slide now on the OECS countries. Um, these are six English-speaking countries. They are essentially moving towards an EU-type unitary system. They have a common currency and they tend to adopt common legislation and common practices. So harmonization in this area is very effective. Um, there are UK territories in this area and they are associated states to the OECS countries. Of course, they have the, they got UK permission to do that. Um, oddly enough, um, Martinique and Guadeloupe, the French territories, do have associated status with the OECS, but they don't have any integration at an either level. So the codes will be totally separate from the rest. All right, let me move now to the next slide. I just want to make some quick background points about the East of the Codes. I want to highlight one important point is that the regulatory system for building includes building codes, land use zoning and development plans, and an inspection mechanism to enforce adherence to the codes and plans. We must never think of the code as an end in itself, as part of a larger, broader framework. Enforcement generally is the weakest in the system, often due to human and financial resources allocated as a function. And some people allude to the possibility of political interference. Now, building codes set minimum standards for how structural systems should be designed and constructed to ensure a minimum level of safety for the occupants. The next slide, thank you. The Caribbean region um, has a high vulnerability to disaster and climate change impacts. We have had some very bad cases in the last few years, one in Bahamas, for example, one in Antigua and Barbuda. But throughout the region, we have major problems. And compounded the problem of vulnerability is the prevalence of informal building construction practices. While many Caribbean countries have building codes, there remains a gap in the effective application of informed land use and adequate implementation, and also the implementation of building regulations. These are the major hazards we have. Some earthquakes, landslides, hurricanes, flooding, and of course, the major impacts of climate change. These are pervasive to all of the Caribbean. There are three important documents which are propel the movement of building codes in, in the Caribbean for regional level. First of all, CARICOM developed some long time ago, the Uniform Building Code. That was used to, um, brought back to each of the countries, refined and reformed, and over the years, some countries have adapted that, um, uh, as well as considerably improved over the 83 version. For the OECS region, which I mentioned to you a while ago, um, they have a model OECS building code. I'm just going to go through this slide of the, which summarizes each country very quickly. If you look at um, Antigua and Barbuda and the Virgin Islands, which are either associated states or, or members or associated, they have a building code which is based upon the OECS model building code. Um, another important country or to look at there as well is Barbados. They have, which I'll speak to later, they have very comprehensive building codes as well as a very comprehensive act, com um, which is a very good model. Uh, Belize has a building act and building regulations. They have, they don't have a national building code, but they have urban building codes for the two big cities, Belrafa and the capital of Belize City. If you could move to the next slide. Um, Thank you. Cayman Islands has comprehensive codes, also comprehensive legislation. Because of their very high per capita income, of course, they can afford to both finance and maintain effective enforcement. 
Dominica and Grenada um, have a building code, again, based upon the model building code. Uh, and, and, and that is strengthened by their fiscal planning act. St. Kitts and St. Lucia and St. Vincent, also OECS countries, have model building codes based upon the uh, OECS model building code. Trinidad and Tobago has a small building code, and they have done a tremendous amount of work over the years on uh, developing a, a national building code and looking at legislation. They're not there yet, but they're very close. Turks and, Turks and Caicos Island, uh, UK territory, does have comprehensive building code as well as building regulations. Now, I'm going to look quickly at some of the key issues. These are not exhaustive. I'm just stating what are some of the key issues in the enforcement of the building codes and the building regulations. Um, these codes and the regulations are essential to maintain the integrity of the construction system. Uh, the next slide, thank you. Okay, we speak about enforcement of a building code, but what do we mean on the ground? First of all, permitting. Before construction project starts, the applicant should have obtained a building permit. Um, and there are still cases where persons start building without obtaining a permit, but this is being tight. Secondly, the building authorities should review the construction plans to verify compliance with the building code factors of the structural integrity, price safety measures, accessibility, energy efficiency, and others, of course. A core part of the whole process of inspection is inspections. We have two in sort of interesting cases um, in, in the island. One, where a developer, he was well advised by architects and engineers, but apparently did not follow their advice, got permission to build uh, 10 one bedroom um, apartments. And subsequently, it was found that he had built uh, 12 two bedroom apartments. And if you see here, clearly this was a failure. It's still being litigated in the courts, but this must have been a failure of proper inspection. The other important point is, of course, certificate of compliance, that before um, the building is occupied, the certificate of compliance is issued by the building authority. Now, I'll just pause a little to look at this slide, because this is very important. What, when we speak of enforcement, we have to look at what is the paradigm. How do you enforce? What are the measures? Now, a building code by itself may not be that enforceable if it doesn't have a legal underpinning. And I know this may sit a bit uncomfortable, but essentially the code uh, has to grow out at or be linked at some point with legislation. Here are the remedies that have been used in the region where you have both the building code and the legislation, fines and penalties, stop orders, compliance orders, injunctions, order the clearing the building to be a dangerous building, order to pull down the building or some parts of the building, refusal by the building authorities to issue certificates of compliance. And of course, outside of this, the common law of civil remedies of contract or tort to bring civil action against the building for defective building. There are non-legal remedies available. This depends upon the country and the circumstances. For example, if the building requires, as been done by financial uh, banks or insurance companies, there might be difficulties in it to obtaining insurance if um, the building is not in compliance. And there might be difficulty with obtaining lending conditions as well. Some of the issues that are important and pervasive are low-income housing. Now, low-income housing in many countries is done by the government. And the building legislation in, in the countries that have them says that this, the government, the state or the crown, is bound by the legislation. In that sense, if the code is underpinned by the legislation, then the code would apply to low-income housing. A big problem, though, is squatting, illegal occupation of land without title. And that often is put in areas which are very, very vulnerable, such as flooding or areas and other disaster areas. I'd like to pause briefly just to look at some brief examples of some countries that have been acting in recent times, very comprehensive, building legislation. One is the Jamaican Building Act, which is extremely comprehensive. 
and it also gives um, authority to a building code. The Jamaica Building Act as well links the building, the standards authority as one of the key authority in implementing, revising, and updating the, build, the code. Then there's the Barbados Building Standards Act. Again, they also have a code, but very comprehensive legislation dealing with it. And the Belize one also, uh, maybe not as comprehensive, but also quite fulsome in terms of its provision. Other countries such as Grenada, Antigua, and Barbuda have developed regulations out of their fiscal planning act to deal with building and to, to provide for a building code. Um, I'm moving now to make the first point here, which is that building codes cannot stand alone and to be effective should be part of an effective regulatory framework. What do I mean by effective regulatory framework? I'll address that in the next slide. Thank you. Next slide, then. So a, bit, a, a comprehensive regulatory framework requires the following. Building codes in place, legislation which gives approval for the building code, technical capacity to implement the code, monitoring and enforcement and staffing capacity, training for monitoring and enforcement, um, professional qualifications for persons involved in the industry, training for builders and other professionals. And I think the final slide, um, or the penalty today, and a review and regular updating of building codes and participation of, of relevant financial institutions, banks and the insurance sector in the building regulatory process. Finally, on this point, building codes should be locally appropriate and locally available materials where possible and production capabilities. So I turn now to my final point, which is that on the positive side, building codes, building acts, and regulations are tools for increasing people's safety and resilience to change and disaster risks. But to achieve this requires a, in a system of interrelated legislation, codes, compliance mechanisms, education requirements, product testing and certification, professional qualifications, and licensing schemes that support sustainable built environment. Thank you very much. Winston, thank you so much. That really was the most extraordinarily comprehensive uh, coverage of a very complex subject. And um, and I think highlighting the, the important link between legislation and regulation is, is critical. It's also interesting to, to hear how, how different the countries in the Caribbean are in terms of the Pacific and and how uh, how diverse they are, relatively speaking, um, in terms of that the challenge of, of, of taking a more regional approach. Um, we've got lots of questions in the Q&A, which we're going to come back to um, in a minute. But before we start the q and I'm going to invite our final speaker, Ms. Maria Musmuti, to add uh, some final reflections on, on how we can address some of the issues that some of the previous speakers have raised in terms of the challenges we face uh, delivering effective building code. Maria, over to you. Thank you, Peter. Hello, everyone. It's good to be um, uh, to be here with you. And uh, I think I'm one of the very few lawyers in this huge group of 260 people. And usually what happens is everybody uh, um, tells what they are struggling with and they come to you and say, OK, find us a way to fix it which is uh, what I will try to, to do in the form of a response to the key points that have been made by the previous um, uh, speakers. And uh, I mean, many of what I was planning to say has been already covered by Winston, but I will try to elaborate a little bit more because uh, my perspective is slightly different. I am uh, a legal expert, but my expertise lies in lawmaking and in legislative drafting. So I see things more from the legislative design side of things. And um, uh, from that, uh, from where I stand, many of the issues we need to differentiate the different issues in order to be able to address them uh, appropriately. So the first thing that is key to having effective building codes is making sure that we actually have the right standards there. And building codes are uh, enacted in order to introduce requirements for safe buildings. But what a safe building means in different contexts can be a very different thing. 
And this is something that we see very, very often. And in different regions, people say, you know, our building code has failed and blah, blah, blah. And I remember uh, before somebody said, I think it was on that, you know, it's cross learning and influence from other jurisdictions is a welcome thing, but we should always be cautious of the fact that what works in Australia or New Zealand or in the UK might not necessarily be an equally effective solution in a different uh, context. So having the right standards is, I think, the first thing we need to ensure. And the way in which we can do that is by scrutinizing in a very critical way again and again and again the kind of standards that we have in our building codes, whether they are already existing or in our future building codes. So point number one, having the right standards. Second point, and Quite a few of you mentioned, you know, the fact that um, uh, building codes are outdated, the solutions which are there are no longer um, uh, offering, are no longer working. And that is a fact. But what is also a fact is that the global circumstances are changing and now climate change and resilience are creating new uh, um, um, demands from building codes. And to that point, there is no other way but to regularly review and update building codes. Regularly, I do not mean every six months or every year or every, even every couple of years, but at least once every five years, you need to uh, uh, comprehensively or partially review sections of your building code to see to what extent they're working and whether they are fit for purpose. And for those sections that we already know that they are not fit for purpose, we need to initiate a process of review. There's no other way to bring everything up to date and to make sure that the solutions that are written in legislation are working for today. They might have been working 30 years before or even 10 years before. That doesn't mean that they will continue to be working today and in 10 years uh, time from now. So reviewing le legislation in a regular way and in a systematic way is my second uh, point. A third point that was uh, brought up by different, by the previous uh, speakers was to what extent this, these standards in the building codes are understandable and accessible. And that is indeed an important thing from the viewpoint of, of lawmaking because, and one that can be uh, uh, corrected and needs to be corrected because it influences both compliance and enforcements, which were the points that were then brought up as challenges in relation to the effectiveness of, of building codes. So, I mean, the, the current understanding of uh, concepts of good legislation is legislation that communicates its messages in the, easiest possible way to all those that need to be uh, addressed, meaning those that have to comply with the standards in the building code, those that have to implement them, but also the experts that might have to work with them, like the lawyers or the judges or the architects or the, the other professions uh, or the civil servants who are uh, there to enforce and implement uh, uh, the codes. So in the process of, of uh, review, it is important to introduce also this um, this viewpoint of making these standards accessible, understandable, and uh, to communicate them in the best possible way to all the different um, audiences. A fourth point related to compliance, which is indeed a very important uh, issue. Compliance has different, um, there are different aspects of compliance that we might need to think about. First one has to do with resources, is that many of the standards which go into building codes are very closely linked with resources. They have a cost attached to it. If this cost is unrealistic from the perspective of, of local populations or local incomes, that means that our problem is not compliance, but it's the actual standards that we have introduced because they are really not uh, um, uh, realistic. So, Again, we need to question and we need to go back and we need to see whether what we are asking people to do, is that feasible? Is it realistic? Is it possible? If we are asking them to do the impossible, uh, I mean, of course, they will not comply if they do not have the money to comply, which means that we need to come up with solutions. And there are different ways to address that depending on what the problem is. 
If compliance is associated with resources, this is where you can bring in different actors in order to look for subsidies, in order to look for graded implementation or phased implementation to allow uh, this or to revise the kind of standards that you have already introduced in the first place, if these are not uh, uh, realistic. If, on the other hand, compliance has to do with the fact that people do not know or do not understand what is in the building code or what kind of standards it is that they need to uh, respect, there we need to make it easier for them to understand. And compliance can be assisted in a number of ways by issuing guidance through information campaigns, by, by offering uh, uh, information and making it, making it easier for those that need to um, uh, um, comply with the legislation to do so. So again, compliance is a very complex uh, issue, but it has different uh, sides. And depending on where the problem lies, we need to see, uh, um, we need to understand what it is, and then we need to see what kind of solutions. But usually uh, offering information can be a way of facilitating compliance or uh, relieving to the extent possible the cost associated with compliance can also be a solution. Enforcement. Enforcement is the flip side of compliance. So if people do not comply, then we need to enforce. And this is again something that is very closely attached to resources. But resources are again a fact that we need to consider when we are setting down the standards. So if we know that we have a department or we have a sector with one or two or five employees, how do we expect to go from, from these five employees to implementing a super sophisticated uh, um, structure that is included in our, in our uh, building code, our new building code? Which means that we either need to ensure that the resources are in place to upgrade these structures or our building code are, is in fact unrealistic from an enforcement uh, perspective. But there again, so what I'm trying to say is that all of this information needs to be considered when we are actually designing and drafting the legislation, because later it's too late. Anyway, resources will always be scarce. So we will never have as many uh, uh, an inspectors or, or implementers as we would, we'd, we would have liked. But there again, enforcement can be made uh, um, uh, easier or more burdensome depending on what is available. Again, emphasizing compliance is a way of um, uh, you know making enforcement kick in only when in the in the in the uh, more severe uh, cases. But also enforcement, there are different ways of enforcing of, of enforcing legislation using different methodologies like uh, assessing uh, risk and and so on and so forth. Same for inspection. So, again, depending on what our problem is with enforcement, there are solutions to make this as realistic and as um, uh, possible um, uh, it can uh, become. Another issue that was mentioned had to do with the alignment on different pieces of legislation, and that that can also be an important uh, uh, problem because, um, in fact, conflicting legislations are sending conflicting messages to the recipients, to all those people that have to comply or to all those people that have to enforce and implement. So it is and it can be an important challenge and a big uh, problem. And it is one that we need to consciously address when we are reviewing our uh, uh, building codes and our uh, standards. If there are other pieces of legislation that conflict with what, what is in our building code, we need to bring this to the table and uh, address it. And again and again and again, we go back to the issue of resources. Every time that we are asking people to do something or that we are uh, upgrading or changing our response to something as the built environment, we are uh, um, uh, generating uh, costs. So resources are necessary at many different uh, levels. We need to be aware of that and we need to be aware of that again at the point of designing the building code. We need to consider the, the costs that are associated with the, with the implementation and the compliance with our, with our code if you want our code to be effective. And if there is still a gap we need to find strategies and solutions in order to close in 
uh, uh, to close this gap. Otherwise, we will just have this um, a repetition of what usually happens. We put in our building code whatever sounds nice or whatever sounds uh, um, you know up to uh, um, up to standard for today, and then we say, oh yeah, it's a beautiful code, but it's not implemented. It's if if it's not implemented, it's not a beautiful code, and I'm sorry to disappoint, but if all of these facts were there when we were drafting the code, then we didn't do our homework into considering all of this information in relation to what went into the code. So just to uh, um, recap uh, my, my, my main points and I'm closing, first of all, making sure that we are introducing the right standards, right meaning whatever is uh, effective, whatever works, whatever is relevant and feasible for the specific uh, jurisdiction and not necessarily for the world. Secondly, making sure that we review on a systematic and a regular basis these standards. They are not made to last uh, forever. Third of all, ensuring that we communicate and make these accessible and understandable to everything, to everyone who is concerned. Compliance, make sure that we facilitate compliance either by providing information or uh, different ways but uh, uh, um, helping people comply takes the pressure off the enforcers especially if there aren't many uh, uh, enforcers in place and using enforcement methods which are less costly if resources are not uh, uh, in place and then ensuring as well that the, the whole complex of laws that are related to the built environment are to the bit to the to the extent possible uh, aligned so, so this is all for me and happy of course to take questions and respond to um uh, further queries maria what a brilliant um roundup of uh, all the issues that we've been covering in the session so far thank you so much i'm not going to attempt to repeat them all because you've just done that yourself but a really good summary um that we can draw upon uh, as we move forwards so uh, we are running a little late. I I kind of apologize for that, but I don't because I think it's such an important topic as reflected by the numbers still with us uh, in terms of the audience. I am going to let the session run on uh, for 10 or 15 minutes, if that's all right with everyone, because we still have a number of important voices to hear from. And before we uh, we break into the panel discussion and the q and I just want to ask my colleague Asim to run one more quick poll. Um, I know that our audience is weighted towards Africa, and I and I know that um, it's not the scientific set of questions, but I'm very interested to know uh, from those of you out there, how many of you um, feel that your code in your country is fit for purpose? Um, yes, no, or don't know. And, um, and also then uh, whether you think it's being implemented effectively. And as I say, this is by no means a scientific question. Uh, 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 survey, but it's just to get a sense from those of you that are out there who are obviously interested in this topic, um, what you think about the building code in your own country. So is it fit for purpose? And is it being implemented effectively? As I say, non-scientific, but um, interesting to see what you say. Uh, I think it's probably one choice per answer. And um, Asim, let's see what the responses tell us. Well, that's interesting. Um, it's interesting. It's reassuring to know that some of you think your code is uh, uh, fit for purpose, uh, although I have to say it's slightly worrying that as many of you don't. Um, and it's consistent with the findings from other surveys that the majority of you, in fact, it's the same number actually from our original survey, uh, feel that their code isn't being implemented effectively. And, and as we know from Maria, um, we now know that that isn't... In entirely the fault of the legislation. It's also probably the fact that they weren't designed appropriately or that they haven't been updated to reflect current um, circumstances. So thank you very much for that. That's very interesting. So at this point, I'm going to invite everyone to come back onto the screen if they'd like to rejoin. Um, and um, I, I'm going to introduce a couple of um, colleagues who uh, haven't spoken thus far. Um, and I'm going to ask George if you're there. Um, because we've heard an awful lot about the work that's been going on in the Caribbean and the Pacific, but we know we've got a large constituency from Africa and, and that there are issues with, with building code in Africa. So, I, And I'm also aware that you're about to update the building code in Kenya. So I wanted to just perhaps ask you, George, if you could give us a perspective on um, the sort of situation in Kenya and the wider East African region. Over to you, George. 
<clears throat> thank you, Peter. I hope I'm clear and uh, thank you for the main presenters. I think uh, there are some good uh, inputs. Um, first, I would like to say that uh, historically, we, uh, most of us in the region uh, adopted, and I can speak for Kenya specifically, we adopted the uh, British um, code. Unfortunately, we didn't do a very good job at uh, contextualizing it. And obviously, uh, the problems that we might be facing uh, could come from the fact that uh, the initial uh, adoption was not uh, very well effected. And so um, what uh, started to happen as a trigger to the reviews and the updates, uh, I can say uh, probably started in the mid 90s, which is quite a long time because our building code was uh, adopted. The, the current one, the one that is in use uh, in Kenya was adopted in 1968. Um, I believe in Tanzania, they don't currently have a code. Uh, they are actually working with regional uh, regulations, but they are working on one and Uganda the same. Uh, and unfortunately, this is of course goes to the legal issues of uh, slow in uh, uh, adoption or reviews. And in, in fact, the triggers that have been mentioned by the previous speakers are quite uh, relevant to us. You know, uh, there is the, the dramatic crisis of uh, collapsing of buildings starting in Kenya in the mid nineties. Uh, when a, a, a building in the middle of the city uh, collapsed and killed uh, quite a number of people. And that's when we started talking about uh, reviewing of the building code. But for a long time, we were not, we were literally not working with it. We didn't have a gap of the building code. We had one, uh, but if you ask a, a lot of Kenyan architects and developers, uh, they will tell you it's not, uh, not fit for purpose, uh, but uh, uh, really no one was looking at it. And some of the triggers I could just mention that have led to some of the, re the reviews I'm, I'm talking about here uh, could be, of course, the, the issue of collapse of building. We're talking about the issues of um, uh, affordable housing, for example, which has become a very key topic in this country. Uh, and then how to uh, do dignified and appropriate housing. There's also the issues of climate action, which has been mentioned here, and that was not covered uh, before there. Uh, we can also be looking at uh, uh, the issues of, I think there's a lot of social change. I would say something interesting, Peter, that uh, in the building code of 1968, they allowed perimeter wall uh, is, is, is not higher than uh, 1.2 meters. That is something you will struggle to find in this country because by default, due to the divide uh, between the rich and the poor, uh, you have people who are able to afford it, barricading themselves within their, their homesteads in a, a, a wall that is three meters high. Uh, but if you look at the building code, the allowable one is 1.2. So the issues of uh, compliance, the issues of enforcement that uh, uh, has be, have been very well articulated by the previous speakers becomes a challenge. So I would say that the current position is that there are regulations which are existing, whether they are central, or devolved uh, is not the issue. The main issue is that are the, what I would call, let me use the term ignorant professionals and developers using them. Are they building by those uh, current regulations? And it, it remains as a challenge because whether we develop a new code, whether we renew the current code, which by the way, uh, is currently being discussed by parliament and should be approved by this year, the next challenge that will remain is the issues of compliance and enforcement. And we lack capacity both in the devolved unit of government and as well as uh, the lack of capacity for developers looking at it as a, a, a way of building rather than a constraint. Because a lot of people will look at it like the, the building code is constraining my profit margin rather than enabling or making it possible for my neighbors to live well. I, I hope I've responded to your question, uh, Peter. Thank you. Uh, no, George, uh, you have, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, you painted uh, you painted the picture of what's going on in, in, in Kenya, certainly very clearly. And um, and I gather you, we may have one of your colleagues on the uh, call with us, a gentleman by the name of Weweru Gachecha, um, who's currently serving as a board member of the National Construction Authority in Kenya. Um, well, where, if you're here, um, my colleague Asim is going to give you access to join the session and, and welcome just a quick comment from you on particularly the, the new building code in Kenya or the upcoming new building code in Kenya and how and whether 
um, you think that that might address some of the issues we've been discussing uh, this morning here in London anyway. Um, where are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I hear you loud and clear. I'm happy for you to turn your camera on if you wish. Um, but perhaps you'd like to just uh, give us a comment on um, on the situation with the new code. Um, okay, so I think George has pretty much covered it. The new code is uh, presently before Parliament, both the National Assembly and the Senate for discussion. Uh, having gone through a whole series of uh, processes in line with the Constitution and laws, and hopefully it uh, is uh, adopted into law this year. But um, I think, as George said, we'll have serious uh, challenges with compliance and uh, enforcement, in my opinion. And that's me sitting with the National Construction Authority on the board. And we're supposed to be the guys implementing it. We struggle across um, compliance, across enforcement of the existing code. And um, I, I think we've got larger issues than... Uh, you know, uh, laws and regulations, we've got uh, political dynamics, we've got governance uh, issues that uh, uh, I think we must overcome before we hope, uh, we can hope for a code to improve our, our built environment and the fabric of our buildings. Thank you. Well, Eri, thank you very much for coming on and, and, and being so candid. Um, I think it's clear from what we've heard from other speakers that your experiences aren't um, unique, unfortunately, and that this is a commonly experienced uh, issue. So, uh, Eri, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to invite Andrew, uh, sorry, Robert um, now, Robert Lewis Lettington um, from UN Habitat. Robert, uh, we've been talking about um, affordability. Uh, in terms of implementation, and um, and I wanted to know, particularly from you and Habitat's perspective, you know what what steps we can take to protect um, the safety and well being of the urban poor in particular and other uh, vulnerable groups, and and perhaps more controversially, whether it's it's actually realistic to expect us to be able to protect all sections of the society equally. Robert, if you're there. I am, yeah. Uh, yes, all the easy questions. Um, I, I I, would just like to, first, I mean, I'll keep the comment as brief as I can, but I would first want to link this back to, to a point that Maria was making. The, the question really in a lot of these situations is determining from a policy point of view, what does effective mean? Because if you don't decide what effective means, then whether you're implementing effectively or not becomes a random question. And the problem with building codes, which is why I link this to your question, is that it's politically very difficult to decide what is effective. We know what is effective from an engineering point of view. Sure, we can assess risk and we can look at risk compared to construction techniques and materials, and we can come up with a conclusion of you need X or Y to live in this situation. The problem is politically, we have to come up with money and inclusion to do that and governance and everything else. And in most of the equations, you can't achieve what you would like to technically. So you have to look for something else. And politicians are very good at looking for something else, but very often technicians are not so ready to adapt to that because they want to keep a certain level to their technical standard. But trying to get a dialogue between the two is where the challenge really comes in. I would say on the plus side, this is not new or unique to this field. Any field that has an element of safety and risk to it has the same calculation going on. We can make the safest car in the world or the safest airplane in the world, but it will have all kinds of other disadvantages if we overload it on the safety side. It'll be expensive, it'll be slow, it'll consume too much fuel, whatever it may be. Um, so we're looking at how do we get a balance and we know how to do this we've done it in these other areas we might not politically always be happy with it but we know what the the ways of addressing it are so it comes into a question of looking at what are your minimum standards not what are the ideal what are the aspirational what's the line beneath which i'm not prepared to go 
And how am I going to progressively implement that? Because it isn't all going to change tomorrow. For example, the tradition in building codes of allowing building codes to accumulate that, you know, a building is in compliance with the building code that was in place at the time the building was built. So you don't have to update with every new code. So we are used to that idea of progressive implementation and adapting as we go along and that there is an element of risk to that. And then, of course, the final thing of getting a realistic assessment, which mixes risks, resources and political priorities. How big, how frequent is the risk, standard risk analysis? What are the resources I have on hand to be able to deal with this? And how much political priority is attached to dealing with it? Because most of the time, for example, when we were hearing about the Pacific um, examples and it was sticking in my mind with, I think it was Fiji saying, we've got a high prevalence of category five hurricanes now. That you can quantify in that situation what damage a, quad, a category five hurricane is expected to do depending upon location, materials and other basic factors. That means you can make a reasonable projection of what the cost in lives lost and the cost in financial damage is expected to be with different scenarios. The problem is politicians don't want to discuss that openly because how can they ever say publicly a lost life is acceptable? Uh, but sadly, we know in lots of areas we have to do that. Why that comes down then to the question of the poor is obviously they're on the sharp and receiving end of all of this because they're the ones with no information, no decision making and no resources. And that does have a challenge. Will they ever be protected equally? No. Let's be just brutally honest. But in society, that always happens because and it's not just poverty. Different groups start in different situations and they have different access to information and resources. The obligation, therefore, falls on the government to do what it says in SDG 10.3, to achieve increasing equality of outcome. How does the government try and flatten things out as much as it can to bring everybody to a closer level? Particularly, I'm always minded of a quote I use very often that, that a, a, an early secretary general said about the UN, the job of the UN isn't to save it isn't to take us to heaven it's to save us from hell and a building code is the same thing it is how do we prevent the worst anything we can do over and above that great but the basic job is stop the worst happening and that's the government obligation and as much as possible to push forward into a political discussion that says there are trade-offs here and we have to make some choices but as a society, what do we feel is our basic minimum obligation towards the poor, the vulnerable, those who find themselves in an environmentally risky area, these kinds of things? And then we push forward. And, and the, this all sits within a framework. It's not abstract. This is part of the right to adequate housing. People have a right to a habitable house and to the other elements that come in. It's government's job to work out how to take a step by step closer to do that. So it won't ever be equal. And in a way that's okay because the diversity of life is one of the joys of things. But how do we achieve a minimum standard that we understand and that as a society a community, we're prepared to say, this is a fair approach. And that's really what it comes down to. Thank you. Robert, Robert, thank you very much. And uh, the, the, it feels to me that the conversation is getting richer by the moment and also more real by the moment. Um, and I just want, to, I'm conscious that we now are actually over time, but I'm, I am going to let the session overrun a little bit because we've still got some important issues to tackle. And um, and I'm desperate to hear from Jonathan in a second. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to introduce the idea. Nobody's talked about regulatory impact assessments yet. And I, and I don't want to reduce this to a process. But on the other hand, I think what you're saying, Robert, if I hear you rightly, correctly, is um is there needs to be an element of transparency and realism about this in terms of what expectations are and what what is actually deliverable so i wondered whether you or maria have a view on the use of regulatory impact assessments as a tool for um for this for enabling this process to kind of uh, occur in a more orderly manner and a more transparent manner um maybe i'll go to maria actually quickly if you've got a comment on that 
Thank you. Yes, I mean, all of the issues that we discussed, and thank you, Robert, for uh, uh, presenting everything so nicely, um, are issues that can be addressed uh, uh, or can the impact assessment can actually help you put these issues on, on, on the paper, on the table, on the discussion table and address them in a, in a clear way so that they are not a fact that appears out of the blue, you know, after something has been enacted, but it's a fact that you take into account when you are deciding how to go about things, which is what Robert was uh, was saying. And we need to be realistic about it. And the more realistic we are, especially when defining what it is that we are trying to achieve, what is safe in a given environment, how much of that can we actually uh, safeguard through a building code? The most uh, uh, realistic we are about that and, and measurable and quantifiable targets, the easier it will be to find a solution that can work. And if we think about costs and if we think about potential benefits and everything in advance, and we, and I mean, impact assessment really offers you a way of doing that in a systematic way, you have a, a, a roadmap on what is the best option to get there. So that's that's where... Uh, evidence-based lawmaking comes in. The, this is where legislative design comes in, where all of this is considered early on so that you can come up with the best possible, the most fit for purpose solution rather than put something on paper and then whine because it's not working, because it's not the right one or it's not the, you know, the most effective one. Yeah, thanks, Maria. And, and Robert, just sort of picking up on that then in terms of actually bringing in other stakeholders as participants in the process of making regulations. I think this is something that Andrew touched on, but presumably you feel that's, or do you feel that's an important element in this work? Engagement and inclusion? Absolutely. And, and just to cheat slightly in answering your question, I would say that REARS are one of the regulatory impact assessments are one of the ways that you can use to draw some of the political sting from the discussion. Sometimes where you have a challenging situation, you need to break the discussion up a little bit. And if you have a very technical side to the discussion, you can then connect that with a more policy driven side and and sort of deflect from the political pressure of saying we must protect everybody to take it away into a technical discussion that says in line with the policy direction, this is what we can manage. And ARIA allows you to do that. And then, as you say, you can bring in the different stakeholders who are, you know, you can do the job that politics is meant to. The people who come in and say, this is what it will cost. This is what we're prepared to pay. The people who can do the risk analysis, the people who can say what is culturally appropriate, what fits our political aspiration. These are all slightly different conversations that the political process should bring together and then help you find what is the compromise solution. And then of course, as others have said earlier, you periodically review that and come back to it and say, is it delivering what I want it to deliver? Over. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, um, you and I were in Paris last week for your Buildings and Climate Global Forum. Um, I, I don't know what you've made of the conversation that we've been having thus far, but at, but at that event, obviously, uh, it was recognised the the need to enforce building codes was recognised from the context of climate. And I wondered if you would just like to say something about the work of the Global ABC, um, the importance of this topic in the context of that conversation last week, and um, and maybe the gap that exists between where we are now and where we need to be. Jonathan, and I leave it for you entirely to decide whether you wish to use a handful of slides or not, because I think um, it's important we hear from you. Thanks, Peter. I'm not going to use slides. I mean, I can <laughs> try my best to answer you know, this question. I mean, I agree it were very rich discussions. And you know, when I listen to all this, like, you know, coming from this large lens of thinking about climate change, and you know, I would even talk more about sustainable development and sustainability overall, it's kind of a complex issue and you know trade-offs are a very important element but it's really important also of course to bring everybody behind trying to make the change happen in any case we need to change things no and i mean i heard like progressive implementation i mean or even i think we've been progressive overall 
all the time. I mean, we talk about Europe as being, of course, one of the most advanced countries when we say your areas in terms of like, let's say, integrating sustainability in, in building codes, integrating circularity, whole life carbon aspects, a lot of, you know, interesting like issues. But, you know, even in Europe, it takes a really long time before you can actually agree on the standards, before you can agree on building codes. And then, you know, the whole issue of implementation, enforcement, uh, you know, it's even if we are in maybe the countries where it's working relatively well, well, you know, there are also still quite a number of challenges. I mean, the, the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction is, was started at COP21 more by the, the thought that, okay, the building sector is kind of totally under the radar in all the discussions that we're having about climate. It started with a very strong, I would say, more mitigation lens, uh, saying, well, the buildings, it's about, well, 21% of GHG emissions globally, so it's one-fifth, it's a big part. And then also looking, of course, the energy consumption overall the buildings. But but I think the conversation has also evolved quite a bit, and, and the, 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 the points related to resilience now are coming very strongly up also. Um, one of the one of the the ideas of the global alliance was basically to say, okay, it's a very complex sector to address. There are a lot of actors. It's a very fragmented value chain, and how can we actually bring all the different, you know, actors that are working along the value chain of buildings, um, you know, together to actually see, okay, how do we address the situation, and together with the governments, because as we were saying earlier, I mean, the stakeholders, it's, I mean, governments cannot kind of just make legislation, building codes on their own, they also need to talk to the professionals, to the ones, the practitioners, the ones that are really engaged on the ground to implement everything. So, so that was the whole kind of idea of, of building this global alliance. And I think, I think that the forum last week, Peter really showed that, you know, the community is there and has been created. Um, and it's, it's kind of working in the sense that, you know, now the buildings are much higher on the radar. Actually, this year, it's, it was decided that is the priority topic under the mitigation work program uh, for the for the UNFCC COP. So um, under this whole lens of, of climate change, it's really now, you know, coming up. Looking at like building codes, because we of course produce our global status report and that was also launched at the, at the forum. I mean, the building codes currently, I mean, we are looking at, you know, maybe half of the countries globally having building codes, actually. So there's still like half of the countries in the world that don't have building codes at all. And of course, when we talk about these half of the countries that have building codes, we are far from having, okay, what we said earlier, you know, the wishful thinking, maybe building codes that are perfect and would solve all the issues that we would like to see solved, you know. Uh, and then there are a lot of building codes that, of course, that exist that still need to be really you know, updated and, and it's definitely an iterative process uh, to get there. I think the, 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 the real worry is more that, you know, in my view is that, you know, the problem is that yeah, continents like Africa, where a lot of the construction is going to happen over the coming years, they are the continents where there are almost no building codes in place. I mean, the, the largest number of countries that don't have building codes are currently in Africa. At the same time, we're saying that that's where most of the construction will be happening over the coming years. So that means that a lot of construction is going to happen in countries where there are no building codes currently. And then we also want to make sure that actually those building codes, that, that they are maybe not doing what we've been doing so far, uh, building buildings that today we might want to change because actually they're not fit anymore. And we're re realizing the impacts of, well, I guess the impacts of having thought about beautiful buildings that we could build quickly with cement and concrete and where we would put some nice air conditioners inside and always have thermal comfort. And that, of course, now we see as a lot of other impacts that don't work anymore. So we need to go back to practices that maybe we had before, more passive approaches in buildings overall, integrating really these aspects. And then also think about you know the future climates that we are having. Uh, I think that's the thing that currently... There's very little uh, thinking in 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 the codes, but I would say more largely in the regulations and uh, and and even the strategies on buildings. It's like, okay, how do we think about how our climates are going to be in the future, and how do we make sure that actually the buildings that we're building today are actually going to be adapted for the future? Because at the same time, we're saying, okay, we need to extend the lifetime of buildings. 
uh, you know, we need to have buildings that last because of, you know, all the embodied carbon that goes into it. We need to refurbish existing buildings. So we're looking at buildings that last for a long time, but we don't know currently what climates we will have in the future. I was told that a lot of the insurance companies have done a lot of modeling and have that kind of information. But a lot of that information is unfortunately not something that is really available for free for people. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the, the big issues for me. It's like, how can we make sure that, you know, well, data is better shared, information is better shared. And that's where, yeah, I would say overall, it's really critical that, you know, the, the different actors really work together. So we're working really at very micro level because we're trying to really think, okay, it's not just like one country that's going to come up with the perfect way to do you know the future buildings it's actually the world that needs to work together to make sure that the buildings all over the world are actually the right ones I mean, which is nice but i totally agree at the same time the reality happens on the ground and the situations are very different from one country to another but at the same time uh you know these discussions that we're having under the buildings breakthrough for example that was launched at the, at the cop last year Exactly the points that we that we put forward is, well, the first thing is really to work on the standards and to actually discuss about, okay, what would be in, in a way like, let's say the minimum kind of standards that every country to some extent should think about, not saying that they should be the same everywhere, but at least in terms of like, what would be, you know, some commonalities that we can bring, or what do you need to think about specifically in, in a sense for each of the, of the standards. Then, really pushing on, you know, how can we accelerate the demand for, you know, the more like, let's say, climate, um, climate proof buildings, low carbon buildings, uh, and, and they're really pushing more on the, I would say, well, the public sector to show the way in some way, uh, and especially public procurement. I mean, a lot of the construction happens through public procurement, if governments could already make sure that they do it in the right direction. That would kind of transform the market quite a bit because a lot of the bigger companies would, if they don't start to be aligned, you know, they would lose big markets. So they would need to start really starting to get aligned with those uh, those approaches. So that's, I think, a very important element. And then the other thing for, for me personally is like, if we really want to change all this, it's about residential, no? Because in the end, 70% of the buildings are residential buildings. And what I see a lot is that you have a lot of, beautiful buildings that are out there, which are beautiful shopping malls, nice big hotels and resorts that are, you know, that might be the best and have the nicest certifications, let's say. But you see it very rarely for like, you know, affordable housing and housing overall. So I think it's really about like, well, concentrating the efforts towards that sector, because I think that's what would kind of really change things. Mentioned finance earlier. Finance, I think, is absolutely critical. It's another element under the buildings breakthrough that we're looking into. How can we accelerate finance? There were at the forum, actually, we had them, some meetings prior to the forum where we had all the development banks coming together uh, and discussing how they could align better on their finance to support better, again, with strong emphasis on housing, so which I think is very good. Um, Research and development also. I think R&D is also a very important element uh, in the fact that, well, there are a lot of things that happened before that we have forgotten that we can bring back and maybe try to make them you know, sexy again in a way and also align with some of the realities of today. We talk a lot about digital, how digital can help. Uh, I don't think you know, we'll have you know, BIM for every building around the world. I think this is something you know which may be way over the top but there's a lot of digital solutions that can even help for lower cost and and you know faster solutions in a sense and then capacities and skills is definitely a, a very a very very big one so yeah i would say a lot of work still to do on our side but i think really this cooperation between between everyone that we are trying and we've been pushing for the last eight years and I think we came with the forum with like a moment for us that was a, a big moment showing that the community was there, but also now we have 70 countries that agreed that they really need to act on this sector and, and agreed on a certain number of principles um, uh, to take this forward. So, Peter, please. 
<laughs> no, no, Jonathan, I think that's great. It's, it's really good. And, 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 and it does kind of bring us towards the conclusion, actually, because uh, the point about there, there having been 70 countries signing up to the declaration uh, at the event last week is important. We've had some questions, for example, from Tanzania, which we've heard, I believe, doesn't currently have a building code, but is developing a building code. And the question was where to start uh, building a code and what should the priorities be? And I just wanted to make the comment to the um, uh, contributor for, participant from Tanzania that Tanzania is one of the signatories to the declaration uh, which we we're talking about last week so um, Tanzania, Uganda, Zambia, I'm just looking through the list here, Kenya, Samoa, um, all of these countries were represented at the event last week and are signatories to this declaration which we will um, put a link in um, uh, to uh, uh, our follow-up on this session so that you can see um, which governments have expressed a commitment to um, pursuing this topic and perhaps through our member organizations um, linking with your governments you can help support them in this work uh, because it's obviously very important. I'm very conscious of time I'm incredibly impressed that we've still got 234 people with us so clearly there's a lot of interest in this topic it's such a rich topic I had a number of other questions I wanted to ask our panelists but I, I don't want to uh, presume on people for too much longer um, however, I do want to just cover one or two of them, if I may. Uh, there was a question about the regulator impact assessments and whether there is a process that can be circulated. Um, I, it's a long time since I've looked at this, but Maria and Robert, uh, uh, as as the kind of um, what I imagine to be the experts in this area, is there a, is there a process? I know the British government has a a documented process. Is there a regulator impact process that we can circulate to our uh, participants? There are examples. There are examples from uh, around the world for different governments. M many governments use impact assessment processes for legislation and policies. So, I mean, examples can be found, but there is an answer. I tried to answer to Aisha's question that uh, a, a tricky point is that um, we can find all of this information, but uh, impact assessment should never become a tick the box ex exercise, that's the danger. It should be a meaningful process of collecting this evidence and this data and really um, uh, uh, considering it in order to make the best solutions possible and come to the best possible results. It's not just, uh, so yes, and the templates are not uh, very different, the one from the other, but, and they are available and happy to make some examples available, but uh, be mindful of that, yeah. Yeah. OK, so we will put some links into uh, one or two examples um, in the follow up uh, emails. Another question here from um, Bandula, who asks, is there an agency to whom we can turn for advice on building code? Um, uh, and I'm wondering also whether there's a, there exists anything like a model code. I mean, I know in the States they have this thing called the the IBC. Um, which is a very prescriptive code and certainly not a universally relevant. In fact, I wouldn't recommend it. I wouldn't even recommend it as a starting point necessarily. But um, but but does anybody know of any um, agencies? I mean, the Global ABC, Jonathan, um, are you able to point people in the direction of organizations that can help with this work? It's a good Sorry, question. I, I guess, I guess the, the challenge, Peter, is often, as you say, like, you know, that there are many organizations working on it. And then, you know, you have like different organizations that have their different lenses. So, I mean, you know, yeah. we work with the International Code Council, for example, that has a very US approach to codes. Exactly. But then of course, you know, so I I do think personally that it's actually the, the richness is more coming also from actually the countries and the governments themselves. Uh, you know, so I, I believe in cooperation also between governments on that because the governments are the ones that actually have the, the 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 real experience with the building codes, also with their implementation and their challenges behind it. So I think there's quite a benefit actually for for like you know bilateral type of collaboration, uh, you know between countries that have that are have similar type of contexts in many ways and can kind of share you know some of their progress. Some of the countries that I feel have been making big progress on their building codes, India for example, they have done pretty big progress lately on the building codes. Uh, and then, of course, I mean, European countries, but that might not really fit with, you know, I, I was taking a, a global south country, put it, putting forward a global south country, because actually, I think India also, with India is a continent. I mean, it's like, you know, it has all these different climate zones. Uh, and so, 
and I think there they actually have done quite a bit of work, and we're currently working at integrating also the part of embodied carbon into their building code at the moment. So, okay. yeah. Okay. So, well, I mean, let me just say from the Commonwealth Association of Architects perspective, this is obviously a topic that we're going to continue uh, 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 engaging with. And um, through our knowledge sharing partnership, um, I, I, I suspect we will be we will be hearing more from us on this topic in the months ahead. I am conscious of time. I'm very sorry that we haven't been able to get around to the, all of the questions I had to ask and all of the questions that others have asked. We will um, circulate the questions to our colleagues, uh, panelists, uh, and those who are able to um, perhaps respond to some of them. We would invite them to do so, and we'll, we will share the, the answers. But um, maybe before we do bring the session to, to an end, I just want to go around the screen and, and ask each of our contributors if they've got any kind of final takeaways in terms of um, comments from the session or recommendations going forwards. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on everyone in, in turn, and I'm going to start, if I may, Tim, with you, if that's all right. Any final thoughts on, um, on moving forwards? Uh, thanks very much, Peter. Um... Uh, yeah, maybe just the, it was really uh, reassuring to hear um, uh, some of the thoughts from the other panelists, um, in particular, uh, Maria talking about, uh, you know, this idea of uh, a good looking code that sits on a bookshelf that's not actually used. And I think in the Pacific, this is we have to keep this front of mind. Um, it really it, it's not what the code looks like. It's when you walk down the street in one of the urban centers or you hop on a boat and you walk through a village in a remote community um, and you can do that before or you could do that after the category three four or five cyclone and that's really the going to be the the measure or the success of the building code is is, is what these communities look like after that cat four cyclone go through so thanks to, uh, for maria and the other panelists for putting this front of center thanks very much tim Anne, I don't know if you've got your voice back, but if you have, um, any any last thoughts from you? I've got a bit any... of it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I just think it's uh, it's really interesting. Is uh, unlike um, you know developed nations, our building codes have to you know like um, span a far greater um, you know um, typologies of buildings. You know we've got we've got informal settlements, we've got you know traditional um, living situations as well as these big multi-story, you know, buildings with complex um, building services and things like that to address all, all at once. So um, I think that, you know, the Africa, Caribbean, Pacific um, experience is, is unique in that way, that we do have so many other sorts of um, cultural and socioeconomic issues to deal with. Um, so and it's, it's, it, it is really heartening to um, see that, you know, like every, we are all facing the same sort of issues and that, um, you know, to be able to work together and look at different ways that we can sort of be more inclusive and um, to try and sort of bring building standards up for everybody, not just enforcing the big high rise buildings, but also to educate and help, um, you know, like the people who are at, at the other end of the scale. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, actually, uh, you've just introduced yet another really important issue, which is that in many of the countries we're talking about, you're experiencing new typologies of buildings. I mean, high rise buildings in the in the Caribbean, for example, I know, um, are, you know, starting to become more common and the codes don't necessarily um, accommodate those new building typologies. That's a whole other session. <laughs> um, uh, Andrew, any 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 last reflections from you? Uh... Yes, I, I'll just continue from the last slide where I spoke on affordability and the developing of uh, local uh, building materials because um, we having uh, challenges competing with the price of bringing steel and cement, importing it from overseas and then uh, bringing it to the shores and then cutting it up into the mountains um, for people who occupy hilltops. I, um, in Fiji, we have the uh, folk uh, villages up there and uh, who, are, who are not able to afford the cost of uh, transportation to get materials from the coast up to the villages. Uh, one thing is the distance. Second thing is the availability of uh, vehicles. And um, another item is availability of roads. Um, the, the available material for them is bamboo and timber, which is right there outside their door uh, houses. And it's more affordable for them to learn how to, to use that readily available material to get themselves into uh, resilient, uh, sustainable buildings. 
now um, I go green and I go about uh, local uh, sustainable uh, building materials. And I know that um, the local knowledge here is aware that just by um, warming up, uh, not fully roasting the bamboo, local knowledge knows that you can make it to a mite uh, resist, uh, take, out, take out all the uh, sap that the insects get into. So uh, pushing on on the issue of uh, uh, developing local, affordable, sustainable materials is a, a big need for Fiji. And uh, maybe it could be a, a third topic on uh, CAA agenda in the upcoming uh, next period about um, having a joint uh, agreement or joint um, collaboration. Um, we have found that uh, trying to voice it as um, an individual country to funding agencies to make housing more affordable has not been successful. And then we tried to work with uh, PRIF to get a regional um, uh, collaboration happening. And so um, it's connected to uh, making building codes work. And um, it's already developed well enough to get five resilient housing in uh, Manila, Philippines, with earlier um, work in Cambodia, in um, Colombia. So the, ex the, inf the, uh, the information, the expertise to get it up into Cat5 resilient bamboo housing is there. Uh, it's just for the voices to get together and, uh, and compete with uh, dom the monopoly that steel and uh, concrete has on our market. So um, that's my like closing uh, encouragement uh, to making uh, re resilient buildings available and affordable to more of the community. I'm from government, so I think, as rightfully said by Robert, um, I, I, I'm trying to play my role in trying to make things accessible. Thank you, uh, Peter. <laughs> Andrew, thank you very much. And you're absolutely right. New typologies, new building materials, which probably means more frequent r reviews of building code and building regulations. Um, and, and as you know, we're trying to help you advance that cause um, in the Pacific, and we look forward to continuing to do so. And yes, we will have an event on bio-based materials shortly. Um, I'm going to have to ask our panelists to keep their closing remarks short, if we may, because I am conscious of time and it's all my fault, but it's just such an important and, and interesting topic. Uh, Winston, any last thoughts from you? Uh, just a few. On the enforcement side, I just want to bring your attention. There is an emergent situation where both the parliaments and the courts are giving greater recognition to the public involvement in enforcement. There's a recent case um, three weeks ago where the Privy Council upheld the rights of Antiguan Barbudan citizens to bring an action to an injunction to block, to stop a building being constructed in a very sensitive area. Um, the Cayman legislation does allow private citizens to make complaints online about buildings, illegal buildings or any building breaches. I should point out that we are, have developed in the Caribbean and in some of the islands quite a sophisticated method of looking at the whole legislative structure. Uh, a lot of my work involves doing, um, I've been involved in legislative development for over 30 years. And what I've noticed now is that in getting, um, going to parliament, going to cabinet, I should say, you have to satisfy cabinet about the cost of, of any new means of piece of legislation. And that there has been thorough consultation with all affected areas of the community and all sectors of government and profession. So for example, in the recent building legislation it took over a year of extensive consultations with grassroots people. The other point I would mention is that in the Eastern Organization of Eastern Caribbean states, their collaboration in implementing codes individually, but as well as a group, has been quite a useful experience. And, and so something like that will be followed by the wider Caribbean. Very good. A final Very point good. is that oh. a number of the countries, uh, Jamaica and Barbados, are linking the Bureau of Standards in the development revision of course. So there's quite a lot of work which actually precedes the, the final development and the legislation of these matters. Winston, thank you very much. Um, again, very important contributions in terms of stakeholder engagement, public engagement and regional organization. Um, George, 
final thoughts from you we're nearly there <laughs> thank you um i think uh, as uh, urban uh, areas are rapidly densifying and particularly in the, uh, the developing countries i think building codes are even more critical uh, particularly for the lower ends of the uh, communities where most people have no control of what is being built by their neighbors and i think from the learnings today the idea of effectiveness comes out very clear to me and we need to link um, some aspects uh, of the building code, particularly to uh, things like a people's guide or a practical guide or other regu uh, regulations that are, can quickly be revised so that the effectiveness of the building code can be had. And from my, my, my situation, for example, in Kenya, majority of our buildings are informally being built. In fact, one of the major challenges is actually not the new buildings that are coming up, but looking at the existing stock and regularizing them by retrofitting them. And at the regularization of Kenya, we have been trying to work around uh, uh, tools that can be used to measure the, 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 how good a building is. I'd just like to mention, Peter, if you don't mind, the healthy homes uh, guidelines and checklists, which you have developed, to try to look at the majority of the buildings that are existing are not fit for habitation. So how does the building code then uh, come in to look at that as opposed to the new stock uh, that is coming up. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, yeah. Just when you think you've heard it all, George, you throw something else in, which is so incredibly important and um, retrofitting and um, and the and the context of informal settlements as well. Uh, very, very important topics. And um, maybe we could include a link to that initiative in the material we send out, um, George, the one that you've just referred to, because I think others would be interested. Um, Robert, any any last thoughts from you? In just a couple of quick ones. I, I would say, first and foremost, to always remember this is a hard area and every step forward is a useful step. You are not going to get to the end of the road in one go. Um, and incremental improvement is improvement. I think the second thing I, I would flag, which is quite dear to us, is remember the the objective that this is about improving safety improving the quality of life and protecting lives so don't allow it to exclude people because one of the problems when you come in with the poverty angle is the building codes and others in some contexts are used to criminalize and exclude the point is somebody who doesn't comply with the building code unless they are rich and willfully non-compliant they are not a criminal they are a a victim or a vulnerable person who needs to be helped. And I think it needs to be looked at in that way, that we're looking at codes that facilitate and improve, not ones that exclude and monopolize. Finally, the the point that I, I was noting about the thing of um, somebody saying that, that donors have been approached and not been interested. Housing is a classic area where politicians and donors love to talk a lot, but don't put their money where their mouth is. Usually, I think, because they think it's too hard and too complicated. Always remember that you can come at this from multiple angles. It is about housing and construction. It's about quality of life. It's about human rights. It's also about money. The bulk of the world's assets are property. The quality of those assets depends upon the building codes and the governance that surrounds it. If it takes that to sell it as an issue, to say this is about economic stability, use it. You can also use security, conflict, all kinds of different things. And building codes sit in the middle of all of that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's such an important contribution. I think we have, we have rather neglected the importance of the financial sector, the insurance industry and such like, the pension funds, uh, the role of other stakeholders in helping to raise standards. And I know if I can just cite very quickly the IFC EDGE standard, which some of you may be familiar with, um, IFC Edge, which is all about promoting or market transformation in terms of sustainable development. In South Africa, I'm, I'm told that it's such a popular standard now that um, if you have a house that's built to IFC Edge specifications, you can actually get a mortgage at 2% less market, lower than market rate. So there is a kind of virtuous circle, as you say, I think there's a sweet spot to be found in which we can use the eco economic benefits of building better um, to help raise standards for certain segments, I suspect, if not all. Um, two more left. Jonathan, um, last thoughts from you. Thank you, Peter. I, I, I want to mention a little bit going more macro in the sense that, you know, 
I think it's important for the countries and for like the stakeholders at the national level to have a vision, um, you know, set targets, have a roadmap and, and look at holistically about, you know, how do you actually want to transform this sector, taking into account your local reality. So I think it's a, a very important element is to bring, you know, everybody on the same page, you know, and then that helps maybe also driving where you want to go with your building code and how you want to kind of uh, make it progress. Uh, definitely important to have like, a common language overall between the people uh, and 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 then as much as possible think about the holistic approach because the idea is that well we want to transform you know from what we've been doing for a certain number of years now into something better i mean thinking here about you know uh, you know that that links the issues related to energy being resilience uh, embodied carbon materials you know all these things actually need to be taken into account and then a building never stands or rarely stands on its own, maybe not in rural areas where they can stand on their own. But, you know, we know it's like more and more urbanized, more and more cities. So the whole part of also how do you think about all the planning and how the buildings connect to each other? I think the buildings are are a great kind of entry point to make many things change. I mean, we we all live in buildings. We all need our buildings. We work in buildings. I think it's a very nice entry point, even for politicians, in a way, to kind of make things change. And I mean, talking about the benefits, job creation. I mean, it's it's thirteen percent of GDP, more or less, globally. When we think about uh, buildings and construction, so it's like it's a large part of the economy in countries. And coming up with like you know newer materials or coming in can a strong potential for job creation. So I think there's a lot of benefits there. And then, yeah. I mean, I, I would maybe as my last word say, you know, I invite you all to to kind of join us under the Global Alliance. I mean, we are working on all these different topics. We have materials working groups. We have resilience working groups. We have working groups working on finance. And the whole idea is to see how we can work together to also bring, you know, the best things that currently exist forward for for everybody else to learn from it and and, and use it. So, yeah. That would be my last words here, Peter. <laughs> Jonathan, thank you. And we will, we will include a link to the Global ABC again with the material that we send out so that um, people that are interested in, in learning more can, can connect with you. So last, last but by no means least, Maria, um, your final reflections um, will be very welcome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my final reflection is that uh, legislation and building codes are not a magic wand. They cannot transform reality all of a sudden, and um, they are a tool. Legislation is a tool that we need to use consciously and for a purpose. And I know that much of what we're saying would be uh, would make a lot of sense to your engineer minds. So I would like to appeal to these engineer minds um, uh, when legislation comes into play and when you are participating in, in legislative uh, processes. And also to make a point that this is not just a technical issue. Uh, there's a need for your knowledge to come together with our knowledge for a broader discussion to take, to take place. It's not just putting the standards there or defi deciding in a in a, from an engineer's perspective or from an architect's perspective or, or an urban planner's perspective, what what is right. There are many things and many perspectives that need to come uh, together. And we're not seeking perfection. And I agree 100% on that with uh, Robert, that we need to take smaller steps steps which are feasible and which can make a difference and then move on to the next ones and the next ones. And happy to continue the discussion. Apologies for having to disappear right now because I'm late for another meeting. And uh, thank you very much, uh, all of you. Maria, Maria, you go. And my apologies also to all of our participants, but we still have over 200 participants with us online. And um, I think that just is a reflection of the, the importance of the topic and the popularity of the topic. I, I'm just going to share some very final thoughts of my own before we bring the session to a close. I think we need to remember that the purpose of building codes, as others have said before, intended to set minimum standards for the design and construction of buildings to protect people in terms of health and, se health and safety and welfare, but increasingly uh, important in terms of addressing issues of climate uh, mitigation and adaptation. Um, evidence, of course, is showing, unfortunately, that in many places they are failing to deliver their intended in, in, in their intended purpose in many Commonwealth countries um, and are also failing some of the most vulnerable members of society, especially the urban poor, whose need is greatest. 
We need to calibrate building codes to cater for the prevailing context and compliance needs to be a form of incentive. Some form of incentivization or support may be required. Uh, today, as we've heard uh, again and again, um, building codes are critically important in, in the context of climate change mitigation and adaptation, and yet many codes are failing to um, address these issues adequately. Regulator impact assessments, amongst other tools, provide a framework for developing building code while also ensuring a more transparent process throughout the decision making process, and I think that's and, and perhaps a more inclusive process as well. They need to work in parallel with existing legislation, such as planning and health and safety and such like. The development of successful building codes involves a range of stakeholders, including technical experts, parliamentarians, legal experts, etc., all of whom have a critically important role to play. This is not uh, the job of one agency uh, alone. And then the impl implementation of successful building code involves a range of important steps, including the preparation of appropriate designs, design review, site inspection, certification, and failure in any one of these steps risks undermining the entire process. Central government needs the political will to deliver successful building code, whilst local government requires both the resources and the skills to do so. And finally, the public should be alerted to the risks associated with the use of unqualified practitioners, which we haven't talked about, uh, and or poor quality contractors, and the benefits of using qualified built environment professionals, such as architects, engineers, and, and planners. Um, so while we've heard a great deal uh, about the efforts that are being made in many parts of the Commonwealth to address some of the issues raised in today's event, there clearly remains a great deal to be done. And the CAA is going to continue uh, to engage with this topic in the months ahead, um, as there are clearly benefits to be had from knowledge sharing between regions and between different stakeholder groups. I want to close by apologizing once again for allowing this uh, session to overrun by quite so much. Um, again, I, we still have over 200 participants, so it's clearly an important topic. Uh, thank you very much to all our contributors for their um, uh, contributions. Thank you all for your questions. I'm very sorry we haven't got around, been able to get around to answering um, all of them. Uh, we will issue you with a certificate, a participation certificate on completion of this event. We will publish the recording and the presentations, uh, and we will invite you to um, give us your comments in a short feedback survey. Until we meet again, um, uh, all that remains to, me, to do is to thank our participants and our contributors once again. We will uh, be following up with you shortly. Thank you once again and goodbye.